All right. Uh, well, uh, good afternoon. Welcome back from lunch, ladies and gents. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. David Rowe and uh, his big phony mesh. And without further ado, we'll uh, let David kick off. Thank you very much, Mark, and thank you all for coming. Yeah, so I'm up against Rusty, which is a big call, so I thank you all for coming. That's, Rust that's Rusty in the back there, I think, actually. <laughs> okay, I'd like to talk about a big phony mesh in particular, the Village Telco project. What we're trying to do is give, give telephones to people who currently can't afford them in the world. Um, so first of all, I'd like to talk a little bit about the problem. Why do we need the Village Telco? Why do we need mesh networks for voice over IP? Um, I'd like to talk about some custom hardware that we've built, the Mesh Potato, to help us solve this particular problem. Um, and I'd, during this session, I'd like us to make a little Village Telco network. Um, I've brought hardware uh, straight off the production line uh, from China, and I'd like five people from the audience to sit here and hack on this during my talk and, make phone, and, and by the end of the talk make phone calls to each other. And I'll show you what you need to do in just a moment. All you really need is a laptop uh, to plug into it and start configuring it. Uh, uh, finally, I'd like to talk about the status of the project and then take some questions. Okay, I'll just talk about the demo f uh, first of all, because those of you messing with the mesh potatoes will need to know what to do. Um, each node in the mesh has its own IP. Um, as they come out of the factory, they've all got the same IP on the mesh. It's this 10.130 uh, .1 address. They'll all be 10.130.1.20. You need to change it to something else that's just not the same as another node on the mesh. Once you've done that, you can make phone calls to each other by dialing the last octet. So if another guy set one up is, is, has the IP last octet 1.123, you just dial 123 on the phone. Uh, so five people who would like to play with mesh potatoes while I'm talking. Paul? <laughs> You need an Ethernet cable? I've got a couple. Uh, yes, gentlemen. Uh, Joel will uh, distribute them. Just keep your hands up there and Joel will take care of that while I talk. You need power as well. The um, default Ethernet IP is 192.168.1.20. You should be able to get into them that way. And I'll leave the rest up to you. The problem in large parts of the world um, mobile telephones, wonderful technology. The GSM handset, the GSM service is great technology. It works in these amazing places all over the world, but it's expensive. For many, many people, it's expensive. In Africa, there are many people who spend 50% of their disposable income on telephone calls. They need them, they really need them, but they're just chewing so much money out of people's pockets who can't afford it. Um, this effect is not limited to the developing world. I, I gave my daughter a mobile phone for her 13th birthday because I thought it would help her budget. She proceeded to start spending 100% of her disposable income on telephone calls. So uh, this effect seems to be all over with mobile phones. Uh, the approach with the, the village telco is uh, what we're going to do is build uh, a mesh network of things called the uh, mesh potato, put them all over people's homes in a village or a township. Uh, they connect by mesh uh, Wi-Fi uh, using mesh networking rather than uh, regular uh, Wi-Fi that we're all using here, uh, and then they carry each other's phone calls and form a, a network that spreads virally. They can talk to people in the outside world uh, by interconnecting with gateways, send calls via IP, and send calls back into the regular PSTN. Uh, the idea of the Village Telco is it's not just charity for the developing world, it's not just technology, we're actually forming a business model around it. We want some guy in the village to be the Village Telco entrepreneur who buys a bunch of these, sets up a, a Linux server in his, uh, in his home, he might live on the edge of a township or something where he's got IP connectivity, and then he starts selling low-cost phone calls through his community. Small-scale community telephony. Uh, and grounded in business, not charity. So this guy will earn an income and sustain the network that way. Uh, I'd like to, I guess, contrast our approach to Village Telco with um, uh, the cell phone approach. Um, one important thing is call costs. Um, we, we're hoping to See, the village telcos have basically free local full call costs and only charge for outgoing calls at reasonable rates. Um, it's a community approach, as distinct from a big business or government approach to telephony. The key thing is it uses unlicensed spectrum Wi-Fi. The real reason why no one can go and set up a GSM network of their own is the, the spectrum licensing issues. Most governments and countries make it in, almost impossible to get a spectrum license, in particular on small scale, which rules out cell phone technology. So unlicensed spectrum is the key. That, of course, has its pros and cons. 
Um, infrastructure cost and availability. Um, some places you can't get cell phone connectivity. If you're a village of 100 people in the middle of nowhere, no one's going to put in a million dollar cell phone tower for you. So uh, with the village telco, we can scale that down to smaller uh, villages, smaller deployments, and it can handle those small uh, scale things that a cell phone can't scale down to. There's also the issue of capital. Um, mobile phone handsets are very inexpensive. Um, you know, 10, 20 bucks, easy to get one these days. But the cell phone towers and all that side of it is not cheap. Um, even some of the small cell phone systems are you know, 10, 20, 30 thousand dollars, and a reasonable one can easily be a million with the deployment, all the site works, electricity that you need to run it. The other key thing for me that was pointed out is that. Um, Phone networks are walled gardens. They're completely unlike the internet. Uh, they're what the internet would be if some people had got their way 15 years ago. Um, they're impossible. You can't put a server up on a phone network. You can't deploy your own networks or do innovative new services. You're, you're stuck within these rigid parameters that governments or telcos define. Uh, a great example is the cost of sending a text message versus the cost of sending an email. Why is one so much more than the other? And the answer is that it uh, doesn't use open, open standards. It doesn't use uh, the sort of technology we've come to know and love on the internet. It's a, it's a, a nasty walled garden. Uh, and that attracts uh, all sorts of problems. Um, it tends to attract bad service and expensive phone calls. Uh, the reason is some of these developing countries, the people are very poor. The government may have no income from income tax. No one's earning anything. Or they don't have a taxation system. Their only income might come from the cell phone network. So, you know, if they cut the cell phone costs, what, they can't build a hospital or run the military or buy a jet or something. Um, so they're one of the only major assets in and often a monopoly that makes it very hard for the government to do something that would really help their people, like lower the costs. Often they're just sold. Uh, in East Timor, Telstra put in a brilliant phone network 10 years ago. The East Timorese government promptly sold it to um, the Portuguese company who now charge, you know, 50 cents a phone call on people who earn a dollar a day. Um, so these phone networks, they tend to be, make a lot of money, which makes them attract some questionable business and social practices. Um, so what to do? About 18 months ago, a bunch of us got together in Cape Town, South Africa. A uh, really interesting and dynamic group of people. Some people were people who had funded development for years and were frustrated at pouring millions of dollars into projects that didn't work. There's a lot of this that goes on in the developing world. Others were guys who were hackers. You get out there in the villages and climb the trees and put up Wi-Fi dishes in, in these developing places. You've probably heard of some of these companies or seen their work. Um, and they, they're familiar with some of the real world problems with this technology, you know, why it doesn't work, things that break uh, in the real world. You know, the cost of a broken antenna is huge when you're um, seven days tra uh, travel away from the nearest uh, other router. So there are all these real world issues with the developing world. Then there was people like me who like doing the technology but like doing it from a comfortable first world country. Um, but still you know, would like to do something to help improve the world a little bit. So we all got together and brainstormed these ideas and we, we had the mesh networking experts from, um, from Germany, uh, from the, the vibrant uh, hacker community over there. And uh, they suggested we use the mesh networks and, uh, and then we, we started brainstorming about the hardware. What could we do to, to make these mesh telephony networks? Uh, after a few days, uh, sorry, that's the basic illustration of the, the village telco. Um, so you have uh, one of these mesh devices on every roof, and that runs to a telephone inside the house, and they all mesh together. Um, the concept we came up with was combining a mesh router with an analog telephone adapter, an ATA. And we realised when we looked at these things that we could build a device that integrated both functions, and we could also add a bunch of stuff we'd like to have. Um, as, you know, as hackers, we're used to buying something off the shelf and reflashing it and saying, oh, gee, I wish it had an extra few megs of RAM or I wish it had this different interface. We just decided to go out and make something that was absolutely perfect for the job we wanted to do um, because the hardware is actually not that hard. Um, most of the value is in the software. So with a, a, a modest engineering effort over the last year or so, um, we've been working on this, the mesh potato. This is a, an illustration of the final version, the production version that's due out in a few months. What's being handed around at the moment are beta units, uh, but, but effectively the same thing in terms of software and electronics. Yes? So what's the IP range of the 192.168.1.20 uh, is the IP of each mesh potato by default. Is that different from the Wi-Fi? Yeah, you can just keep that the same and just change the Wi-Fi interface. It's got two Ethernet interfaces. 
So we're um, aiming at building this device, outdoor enclosure, um, that will set up a, you know, maybe a pole a few metres above uh, a, a shack in a township or something. Target price, US $60. Now that comes with volume. That's just approximate. No one really knows what these things are going to cost. It all depends on a lot of factors. Um, the name Mitch Potato comes from the acronyms POT, Plain Old Telephone, and ATA, Analog Telephone Adapter. We had a Spanish guy with us who said that spells potato in Spanish, so the Mitch Potato was born. Um, so that's what we're aiming at. That's how it started, uh, uh, which is basically a, a, a mashup of a bunch of different hardware boards um, that uh, I happen to have around. Uh, on the far right is a Ubiquiti nanostation, which uses a very similar processor. Um, right to the forefront is something a bit like an Arduino, a little microcontroller, and that uh, handles some of the uh, interfacing between the, uh, uh, the nanostation serial port and the telephony boards, which are on the top there. There's some other telephony hardware that I happen to have around. So this is what... Uh, the mesh potato looked, back in, looked like back in January. Then a few months later, we went to the Revision 1 hardware. Um, that's, it on the, that's it on the right. Uh, and uh, that pretty much worked straight away. There was just a week or two of fighting with bootloaders and things, and uh, we got that up and running. Uh, that, sorry, that was in around about May, June of this year. <laughs> Yeah, well, people have thought about that. Um, some, of, some of the design concepts at low cost, co low cost, of course, this thing's going to the developing world. Um, the Batman mesh routing algorithm, I encourage you to, to Google on that and look it up and read about it. That's pretty cool. Um, th the main aim for these things is just a couple hundred metres between devices. We haven't designed it for really high performance, long range, although it does have an external antenna connector and people are welcome to hack it and use it for whatever they want. For a mesh network, you sort of, by definition, need omni antennas because you don't know what direction the other nodes will be in. The mesh networks are self-healing, self-forming, so the mesh potato itself will decide who it's going to send its phone calls through, and it might weave a path through nearby nodes. So you pretty much have to have an omnidirectional antenna. We made the decision, because we're doing this from scratch, no one's telling us how to build this, to maximise open off software and hardware. So we're not going to use proprietary codecs or anything like that. It's all as open as we can. And we're, we're pretty close to that. Um, it's, it's pretty open. It's based on open WRT, fairly mature build system. Um, Software-wise, it just looks like a regular router running Asterix with some low-level drivers that handle the telephony. Uh, and we managed to integrate the telephony hardware without needing a separate uh, CPU or anything like that. Yes? Are you using the Robin by the way? No. Okay. No. Robin was as a derivative of Batman. We're, we're working with the Batman authors. So, uh, and one of them is watching us on the video right now. Uh, and we'll field some questions perhaps later on if we're lucky. <laughs> um, it has an FXS port. FXS is the fancy telephony acronym for something you can plug an analogue telephone into. FXS. I always remember FXS, S for station. So the FXS port, it, it handles things like makes the phone ring, generates the high voltages you need, etc. Um, we put a little, fair bit of work into making the device low power and something we call Africanisation. Uh, the idea is because this is going in places where the power could be bad, it might be off a lot of the day, um, you might need some sort of battery backup or solar power. We want it to draw the minimum possible power. So the power supply is designed to be very efficient. The fact of simply combining the ATA and router functionality means that um, you basically halve your power straight away. Um, it draws around two watts in a quiescent uh, condition and a little more during a phone call. Africanisation is making it robust to situations in Africa. That's why it's got an end connector on the back rather than RPSMA at least for the beaters, because they're harder to break. The power supply is protected against all sorts of uh, nasty treatment. For instance, you can hook 240 volts up to the 12-volt port. Um, you may laugh, but it has happened. We've seen people do this. Um, you can reverse the voltage. It doesn't care. Um, uh, and also things same with the tel telephony ports protected against lightning, uh, all these sort of things. Once again, because it's... If this thing breaks in the field, it costs a lot more to replace the unit than the actual production cost. So to add this sort of protection is a few cents in the factory, but major inconvenience in the field if it breaks. And if you just choose commodity off-the-shelf hardware, you're not going to get any of this protection, or you've got to add it afterwards. So designing it in from the start is a really powerful idea and something you can do with this sort of hardware development. Some of the challenges. Atheros support. Atheros won't reply to our emails. We send them, we want to sell millions and millions of your chips. We want to help people in the developing world, and they won't talk to us. I don't know why. Uh, we found out later on you've got to pay them $100,000 to get the data. 
that you need to build a router from the chips. That rubbed us the wrong way, being an open source group, so we worked around it and got the thing to go anyway without their help. Um, CPU load uh, was a big issue. Um, one mesh potato, because it's carrying everyone else's phone calls, could be carrying, say, 15 phone calls. Yes? We really don't have a contact in North Atheros. Our partners in China have contacts with the field application engineers in the China office, but no one in California will talk to us. We've got through to the marketing, de marketing department once again, and they're working on it for us. Yeah. If I could just note that if you've got a question, if you wave, I'll run around and deliver you a microphone. So that everyone yes, sorry can about that. Ten? Okay, thank you. Um, CPU loads an issue because multiple phone calls could be going through at one time, so it's got to handle a lot of packet data. Um, the FXS port integration uh, was novel. I ended up, these chips are designed to be very cheap router chips that do what they do very well, which is, say, Ethernet ports to Wi-Fi. They're not designed for telephony, so they're missing a lot of the hardware support you need. I rigged up, well, I guess, an interface through the serial port. That's how we get the speech into the chip, just through the same port you use for a console. Um, you can get access to the console at boot time if you need to, but then it flips into speech mode. So we worked out how to get that going. Um, it's a regular project like any other, we're, so we're coordinating people from all over the, all over the world, um, from Europe, uh, Germany in particular, South Africa, and we have a community now of people from all over the world, and that, that takes some coordinating to make things happen. We also had to learn a lot about RF, uh, Wi-Fi calibration, and uh, play with antennas. Uh, we're looking to design an internal antenna for this, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, another challenge is the, uh, we found about fairly recently is the 802.11 Mac overheads for small packets. Um, the Wi-Fi protocols are optimised for sending large packets close to the NTU size. Once you start sending small packets, the throughput drops significantly. For instance, you might only get two or three megabits through a 54 megabit uh, link if you're sending very short packets. Uh, the other challenge we've got is ease of use. We've got to make this thing really easy to use for people in the developing world. Uh, one of the, the fun things that I worked on the last few months was designing an antennas for this. Uh, we've decided to opt for an internal antenna because that means when we put it in the weatherproof box outside, we don't need bulkhead connectors. We don't need to worry about weatherproof antennas. Uh, we can just have it all internal. So one way to do that is with a, a printed antenna on the printed circuit board. If we can make it work, it's zero cost for the antenna um, because it's just another part of the printed circuit board. But we didn't know whether it would work, so we prototyped a bunch of different uh, antennas. And uh, this is one here. We just designed the printed circuit board, designed it using open tools, GEDA, and then sent it away, got it made, and soldered a little SMA connector to it, and then started doing a few tests. We also messed with um, sort of uh, wire antennas to get comparisons and uh, blogged about the results. Um, so I'll pass them around for people who want to have a look. Perhaps we could some of the antennas we played with. But that was a lot of fun, got to learn a lot about RF. Um, set up an antenna testing range in my backyard, because <laughs> we don't have the resources to do this at a you know, proper test range. Um, and we've got a, a spectrum analyzer there, a bunch of antennas, and we illuminated the test site with an ubiquity nanostation, directional antenna, over five or six meters, and then measured a heap of antennas with a known gain, such as uh, superpass omnidirectional antennas plus directional antennas. Once we'd established the gain of those antennas, we could use that to reference our test antennas. And we found that the printed antennas were pretty much on par with your average um, you know, rubber ducky antenna. Incidentally, what's inside the regular router antenna is 26 millimetres of wire. It's the inner of the coax that they expose. So that's what's doing all your radiating and receiving. Uh, what we've got on our antennas is 17 millimetres of printed circuit board track. 17 millimetres rather than 26 because the speed of light is slower in, in, on a printed circuit board. So it's basically a quarter wavelength at Wi-Fi frequencies. And strangely enough, 17 millimetres of PCB does a reasonable job as an antenna uh, for Wi-Fi. What we've built here, um, and I want to stress, it's custom hardware developed by a community. We didn't go buy a Linksys router and reflash it. We built our own hardware. And I want to encourage all of you to think about this as an option. Um, the sort of effort we put in on this was probably less than a man year for the hardware. Thank you. Um, so if you compare that to the hundreds of man years that have gone into the software, 
it's not a huge amount of effort if you take a look at the, um, you know, we're working off the Linux code base and the OpenWRT and things like that. Uh, plenty of you guys have probably put more than a man year into a project uh, that you've been working on. Uh, but time and time again, we have to go out and buy commodity hardware from some people who don't understand our needs and it's not quite right for the job. Well, you know, I'm here to tell you we can design our own hardware as a community and we should probably be driving the hardware development process, uh, the, the product process, not the other way around because all these guys are making a lot of money off the software we're writing. Uh, so you know, about time the software guys took control, I think. It's a custom mass market product. Um, this thing's going to be built in the thousands and tens of thousands. Uh, it's not just a, a one-off or a little development board. It's open hardware, at least as open as we can make it. Um, you can download the schematic from the Village Telco Wiki. The, uh, the CPLD firmware, which is the little the chips on the board that have programmable logic, you can download that, uh, and the microcontroller firmware, which is a bit like an Arduino, uh, just a little bit of C code. Of course, it's very open software, runs Asterix, OpenWIT, Linux. The drivers are all open software. Very hackable. Uh, we want to see people do strange things with it, and uh, I'm sure there's plenty of applications for a, a Wi-Fi router mixed with a microcontroller on the same board. It's like an Arduino that runs Linux in the background. Uh, there's probably a lot of cool things you can think of to do with that. There's all those analog ports available, uh, etc. if you want to start playing. Um, we've also taken an open hardware approach where we've blogged warts and all our development effort on the Village Telco blog. So. When I spent a week banging my head against the wall getting the bootloader to work, I blogged about it, frustration and all. And the idea is to spread, instead of writing it all down in an engineering notebook, I've been spreading the knowledge around so that other people don't get hit by the same problems. Um, the antenna tests, I, I blogged all that with all my reports because at the start I couldn't find any results on printed antennas on the internet. Well, now they are. And now there's some results about how to build them, exactly how well they test uh, for other people to share. The other advantage is we've developed a tremendous amount of goodwill. Um, I, I lacked, our, our budget for those antenna tests was two or three thousand dollars for a simple, a very old spectrum analyzer. But I didn't have the hundred thousand dollars I needed for something called a network analyzer, which can really tell me exactly how those antennas work. So I said, can anyone help me? And I've had two offers of people all around the world, and they said, send me a packet of the antennas and we'll test them and send you the results. So the goodwill you generate by blogging about your projects, especially a a project like this that's aimed to help a lot of people, it's incredible. So I'd really encourage you to you know, keep blogging and blog the good and the bad about your projects, the problems you have and how you solve them. Status, it works. We can make phone calls over a mesh. Uh, the first phone call um, was in June of this year. Um, oh my Lord. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so he got his working. That was very well timed. <laughs> Thank you very much. That wasn't scripted. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, very well timed. So um, that was a phone call over the mesh network there. Basically, if uh, there'd be a mesh network running now between a few of the, the mesh potatoes. Uh, my extension is 21. Paul knows. Yeah, I don't even know. <laughs> When you're doing phone calls out of the regular, okay. It works all right, that's enough. I've got to keep talking. Hello. <laughs> okay. Um, beta release, yay! It's taken six months, but finally we've got them out. They're shipping this week uh, from China. There's 150 going out around the world to people who joined our community as beta testers, some of them in this room. Um, production, we hope, within about three months. Um, the big thing is getting the case done. We're already working on the, the Rev 1.3 PCB. Um, Current challenges, real world performance. It's working here, which is pretty cool because there's a lot of Wi-Fi at LCA. I got destroyed at the level one of Ustay the other day. I had two sitting next to each other and they couldn't talk. I don't know why, but something in the Wi-Fi world there killed me. I suspect it was a Zigbee out of control on someone's Arduino. Um, yeah, yeah. So there's some issues because it's unlicensed. You know, if we're running this thing in a township and someone's cooking their dinner on a microwave oven, what's going to happen. So we've got some things we've still got to work um, technically and business-wise. If this thing's sitting, does this thing really make money for a, a village telco entrepreneur? Um, we want to work that business model, not just the technology. Um, and ease of use. We're doing a lot of work on um, trying to make this thing easier to use for people. Can we make it zero configuration? You know, these guys spent five, ten minutes working on it. Can we get that down to switch it on and make phone calls? Uh, maybe by pre-allocated IPs. People don't have laptops to hook up to these things in the developing world. Uh, so that's what we're working on now. And that's some links for you uh, uh, to follow up there. 
Um, now I'm going to try to ring one of our uh, colleagues and let's see if this phone call goes through. Uh, this is a, a lady called Electra, who's been my partner in developing the mesh potato. She's part of the, um, the vibrant hacker community in Berlin, Germany. Exactly 12 hours time difference, so halfway around the world. So we can't really go any further. So I'm just dialing her IP on the internet. Stars for the dots. Hi, Electra, I'll put you on the microphone. Great. B bit louder, please. Sorry? <laughs> Sorry, it's just a bit soft. We'll try and get another microphone near you. Um. Okay. Just say hello to LCA, I'll put you back on. <laughs> well, hello, LCA, here's the Electra calling from Berlin. Okay, so there you go. <laughs> So they're all, they're all applauding you, uh, Electra. <laughs> she can hear the applause. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye. So there you go, the world's biggest village telco. Okay, so I'd like to open it up for questions and feel free to come up and check things out and mess with the hardware. Yes, I'll uh, just get the microphone to you. Uh, gentleman at the back first. Yeah, a lady, sorry. Uh, yeah, what voice bit rate do you end up at this stage, like that international call, for instance? That was using, um, I think that was just using ALOL, that one, which is 64 kilobits per second. That, that was uncompressed, effectively. We do have um, GSM and Speaks available. We won't be using G729 because it's a, a lockdown algorithm. Um, but it ends up that the bit rate over the mesh has nothing much to do with the codec because around those few voice packets, you put a bunch of IP protocols, then the Wi-Fi protocol, and it ends up being a couple of percent of the total number of bits or time that's used on the channel. So it's actually pretty independent of the speech compression. Yes, Hadley. Do you have an idea of the power consumption of the FXS and idle? Uh, the whole mesh potato uses a bit over two watts, and I, I reckon a good third of that would be... And uh, the, we currently run it using 48 volts. Mm -hmm. Sorry, the output's 48 volts of the phone, but we could, we could halve that and drop the power quite a lot if we wanted to mm. with a, a small firmware change. Cool. Yeah. Um, did I hear you say it was using Asterix? Yes. Um, could you tell us why you decided to go with Asterix as opposed to OpenSIP or FreeSwitch or sure, something Sure, yeah, like it's a good question. We've actually, this is so common, we've got a fact question on our village telco. The, the reason was very simple. I know how to write drivers for it. <laughs> um, there's no other reason we couldn't... I mean, I'd love to see FreeSwitch running on it, and I'd love to see someone contribute that. Uh, but right now, we've got other things we've got to work on, like getting these things out in the world. Using uh, Asterix or FreeSwitch rather than, say, a, a simple soft phone client was a really good idea because it allows us to set up IVR menus really easily. For instance, if you type 2663, you can change the IP from the phone pad. Um, and that's hard to do with a simple sort of SIP client. It's also great for testing, and we can hook up IP phones directly to the, uh, uh, the mesh potato. Um, so, yes. Have you thought about how you're going to manage uh, rolling out updates once these things are in the field? Yes, there's a gentleman who's taken on exactly that task of how to roll out... Uh, mass updates across uh, a, a mess. His name's Lou. He's on the Village Telco uh, mailing list. It's a challenge problem because if you get it wrong over a mesh and the things come off the mesh, you may... If you kill this one close to you, you can't reach all the ones back to you. So that's, it's a, it is a significant problem. Have you thought about compatibility with the OLPC and using uh, that as a gateway mechanism through the mesh? Yeah, sure. We've actually run the Batman algorithm on the OLPC so they can talk to each other. You could hook up a hand sent to that if you want to have a soft phone. Mm. Oi, who's ringing me? <laughs> Hello? Hi, so have you looked at the... That's the best way I've ever seen to ask a question. Yes, we have, yes. The question was, have we looked at the open mesh devices? Uh, yes, we have. They're based on pretty much the same sort of uh, software. And it, it, that's right. I don't think they're strictly interoperable. Electra could tell us. I shouldn't have hung up on her. But um, uh, Robin's a derivative of Batman, and it's probably a bit more developed and engineered than we're at at the moment. But we'll... So they're like $30 each, and you're looking at $60 each? Oh, don't take the prices by... Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, you know, I'm, I had to throw that up there because someone had asked. I don't know what they're going to end up being. 
but you know, we'll get them as cheap as we can to people in developing worlds. That's right. The other thing is the Robin things aren't outdoor. Uh, sorry, the open mesh devices aren't outdoor. Um, you can't put them in the rain. Yeah, you know, they've got little vents on top. They're not Africanised. They have no protection on their uh, ports, and they don't do VoIP. The VoIP is awesome. Yeah. David, you mentioned that Joel, doing yes. updates currently that you have to manually do them. Are you planning to push them out automatically, or will it be? Yeah, I don't know how that's going to be handled, but that's a really good question for uh, this gentleman who's looking into just that. It scares the hell out of me, automatic updates. But... Um, I'm just looking at your dial plan here. I notice you've hard coded in 10.130.1. extension in, in a number yes. of places, which limits you to 255 or something phone numbers and things. Yeah. Is, is it, I presume it's something you intend to change? Is there reason yeah. to work with that rather than something simple? We like just wanted to demo switching on and make a phone call, and that right. was the simplest way to do it. But you can also dial the full octet. If you look at the other dial right. plan entries there, you can dial, um, I think you can dial two octets or one or three yeah. or the whole yeah, IP. Sort of but, I mean, you could do like zero comp. There's a whole lot of other networking stuff. Yeah, that's right. And we don't really know how that's going to end up. I mean, the guy who deploys it might decide on his own dial plan. Yeah, maybe you'll have to go straight to a server somewhere in the to get authenticated or something before you use the network. Yep. So that's really just our first pass. And it makes for a you know, cool demo and let's just, let's just address that meme of switch it on and make a phone call. Ease of use. Does it work with IPv6 as well or only legacy IP? Um, if OpenWRT works, Asterix doesn't work with IPv6, I don't think, at least not yet. But OpenWRT does, so no reason why it couldn't be done. And it'd help with allocating IPs, that's for sure. Um, I, I know you taken thought to weatherproofing, but what about vermin proofing? I know when we've deployed things in Outback Australia, they end up being ants' nests or whatever, and really plays heck with the electronics. You mean, uh, yeah, what would happen if someone gets inside it? Yeah, good question. I haven't considered that. Rat-proof wires and things like that, I guess. But uh, I'd, no, I'd like to talk to you about that, but I, I don't have any firm ideas. Good, good point, though. Mm. Um, you talked about low power, but could you pop the whole thing? Could you pop? Pot. I pop the whole thing. Don't know how that'd go for heat. Those uh, Athros chips get nice and toasty when you start pumping a lot of. Uh, uh, so, I don't know if that'd be a good idea from heat dissipation point of view. They need the air to get some heat out. But if it was thermally conductive or heat sinked, maybe yeah. If uh, Athros is such a nightmare to get details out of, have you tried other Wi-Fi chips? We were sort of kind of limited at the time because we needed something that would run ad hoc networking cleanly, and uh, do it cheaply. So, but the architecture is really open. So, you know, I'm hoping the best thing I can hope for is someone will bring out a really low-cost Wi-Fi chip with great radio performance and a telephony port built in. That's what I hope. And, you know, if we get volumes up high enough, uh, full custom or semi-custom is not out of the question. Can you comment on... Uh, so your, your setting, you're not concerned about mobility, particularly, no. presumably, um, or particularly large scale, is that fair? No, we've designed the basic network to scale up to around 500 nodes. After that, you can always reproduce you know, other networks outside of that. And no, not, not mobility. Yeah. Um, how does the Batman protocol cope with mobility, for instance? Like if you did plug hey. one of these into a car? Oh, a car, I don't know. I mean, also, you've got to stay within Wi-Fi range, so a well, car will get you out of that pretty quickly, unless the mesh is really, really long. Convoy, right? Yeah, convoy maybe. Uh, that I don't know. Um, I do know that it, it self-adjusts on about, a, it sends a basic little message out every second to adjust it. So if you stand in front of it, you'll see it change its route, for instance. Yeah. Cool. Well, if there's no more questions, um, thank you very much, David, for a very interesting talk. You're there's welcome. a little, uh, little prezi here. Thank you, you. very much. Yeah. And uh, I think we've got a little bit of time left in the session. We've got about 10 minutes. So if you want to come up and have a look at some of the equipment and uh, save some questions in person, you're very welcome. Thank you. Did everyone get their potatoes mesh? Thank you all. Did everyone get their potatoes meshed? Cool. Well, that shows it's reasonably easy to use if you're a geek. <laughs> Hello. Company name in the card. <laughs>